Stellenbosch is where some of South Africa's wealthiest individuals, all male, all Afrikaans and all wealthy, live. Critics have often referred to them scathingly as the Stellenbosch Mafia. But who really are these mega wealthy individuals and what influence do they exert not only on Stellenbosch but more broadly on the South African society? I caught up with author Peter Dutoy who uh, wrote the book Stellenbosch and he explores the roots of the actual town and mostly he looks closely at the term Club of Billionaires. The term Stellenbosch Mafia um, in the early 2000s was used as a, an endearing term almost by financial journalists when they spoke of some businessmen in Stellenbosch, particularly Yanni Maton from PSG, who, who became very wealthy and very rich, um, and their businesses did very well. So it was a it was a it was a colloquial, jokey term that people used. Mm. Um, but in 2016, 2017, with a Bell Pottinger disinformation campaign at the at the height of state capture, mm. uh, Stellenbosch mafia became uh, uh, became a, a negative term. It, it got negative connotations, almost uh, criminal connotations, and 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 so the. That the, the meaning of the term Stellenbosch Mafia um, today is much different than it was uh, 15 years ago. All right, so let's go through the process of putting a book like this together because I can imagine you'd have to be immersed in the town, mm. talk to a variety of people, and then from all of that try to decide which is gossip, which is someone else's opinion, and where the facts lie in between all of that. Well, exactly. You know, uh, you, know you can't, you, I suppose you can write a book built on gossip only, <laughs> and there's certainly a lot of gossip in a town like Stellenbosch. Yeah. It's, a, it's a unique little town, and it's, it's a very pretty town. Down. Um, and there's lots of stories, you know, some people like each other, others don't. So I had to spend a lot of time there, I had to speak to as many people as I could. Um, and then you need to piece together a narrative and a story. And like you correctly said, um, you need to get the facts, you know, that, those are the most important mm. pieces of the book, building blocks of the book, because um, if it's only going to be gossip, you know, people um, see through it very quickly. And if there's not enough meat on the bones of a book yeah. like this, you know, people just won't read it. Um, and also I wanted to do the story justice. It's mm. it's it's very easy to write a book just based on gossip, on what people tell you, people's opinion. And obviously there is a lot of opinion in the yeah. book, but there needs to be something concrete that holds it together. So I spent a lot of time in the town. I, I did first first hand and on the record interviews with, with, with most of the main protagonists mm -hmm. in the story and in the town. Um, and I tried to overlay that with what these companies do. You know, how much are these companies worth? Um, what do they do in society? So, so and, 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 and on the, and, and, uh, the backdrop to that, of course, mm -hmm. is history as well, is the history of the town, is the history of Afrikaner nationalism and apartheid too, which, which I think made for an interesting mm -hmm. story. Let's talk a little bit about that because you can't can't exactly understand the term Stellenbosch Mafia and perhaps any other offshoots of whatever, call it critters critics or those who are trying to peddle stories without necessarily understanding the roots of Stellenbosch and why it has such a unique place uh, amongst those who were Afrikaners mm. and who lived in that mm. place. Absolutely. You know, Stellenbosch um, occupies a very unique place in, 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 uh, in our country's political history. You know, the, the ideology of apartheid, the, ideolo the ideology of, of, of segregation and separate development, as it was called, you know, it was developed there by academics, mm -hmm. by Afrikaner academics at a university, which was a symbol of Afrikaner independence almost in, in, in the, in the, in the pre-apartheid days. After the South African War, uh, also known as the Anglo-Boer War, um, the town became a symbol of, of how Afrikaners wanted to reconstruct uh, their, their people after the war. Um, and that's where Afrikaner nationalism, apartheid, and all the rest of these ideologies originated from. The language uh, became an official language because of pressure applied on government by people in Stellenbosch. You know, some of the country's biggest businesses like Nasbash and Sanlam was established there. So, 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 so Afrikaner business also grew out of that. And I think that's a part of history that, that's fascinating. But, you know, context in our country is so very important. And I, and I, and I, I tried very hard to, to give that context and leave it up to the reader to decide how he or she feels about that. And speaking of that, you also went into, um, you know, depth understanding who the Brudot Bond were, because with conspiracy theorists, you tend to <laughs> yes. get Stellenbosch Mafia yes. being associated with the Brudot Bond, yeah. and then we kind of get blurred lines in mm. between there. So, so I think, you know, we're a country that loves storytelling and loves conspiracy theories, and we've got a very complex history, of course. Um, and the Brudot Bond was a, uh, a formal organization. Um, 
of Afri influential Afrikaners who try to um, advance their own interests by doing shady deals and by doing, uh, you know, by only uh, um, helping each other and, 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 and working in their own network. I don't think the Stellenbosch Mafia is something like that at all. It's uh, uh, what, what I found fascinating researching the book is, is how networks work, how networks, where networks emanate from. Um, and the Stellenbosch network is obviously very influential and consists of, of very wealthy people. But the same happens in Johannesburg and the same happens in Cape Town. Yeah. Uh, these networks emanate from the University of Stellenbosch. Um, and they're just as, uh, uh, you know, in, in networks that emanate from the University of the Witwatersrand or University of Cape Town, institutions like that, um, are just as influential or even more influential than the so-called Stellenbosch Mafia. I think we've, uh, uh, we've got a particular fascination with this because of the town yeah. and because of the characters involved. How easy or difficult is it to be part of the so-called <laughs> Mafia? Like, do I have to be born and bred in Stellenbosch? Or is it a case where, well, if you've got something to put on the table that's worthwhile, worthwhile for all of us, you can come in? It's a very good question. <laughs> um, uh, uh, many of the members of the so-called mafia don't live in Stellenbosch. Um, Christo Visser, for example, um, he lives in Clifton in Cape Town, and, and he's part of the Stellenbosch mafia because he studied at the university. Yeah. The thing that binds them is, is the university, is the town, whether they were born there or whether they live there now. Um, but what I found fascinating in researching the book was there's, there's some tension um, and maybe animosity between the old money yeah. uh, in town that, that, that have been there forever and the new money that's come in from the outside. Mm -hmm. um, all love the town, all use the town as their base, but there is tension. Not all of them like each other, yeah. um, but getting back to your question, yes, I think you need to have been born there. There's a very strong uh, uh, feeling around an incomer, you know, coming from the outside, coming from, c coming into the town from the outside. And someone like Marcus Uerster, mm. even though he studied at Stellenbosch, uh, he was never considered a full part of, of the town's elite, and I think that's something that really frustrated him. But he had a fascinating way of coming into the actual grouping, as it were. I mean, associating himself with the rugby team yes. and various other things that he did. Yes. And at some point, some of it was described as ego because a lot of people didn't understand what the end goal was. Mm. It, it, it was interesting to see, you know. So, so, so there's, uh, it's an elitist town. Yeah. You know, we can't get away from that. It's a town that um, that prides itself. Uh, on, 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 on being a bubble, uh, being a little bit uh, uh, set apart from the rest of the country. Um, and in that town, the rugby club plays a major role. Uh, and he, he saw the rugby club as, an, uh, as a gateway to get access to, to the elite. So, so it did come down to Ego because he started sponsoring the rugby club. Um, and Steinhoff, of course, isn't, isn't a, you know, they don't sell anything. There's no real Steinhoff brand, yeah. but he put in a lot of money just to be part of the club. Speaking of Steinhoff, when it imploded in 2017, to what extent did all of that, um, you know, all the truths we found out about Steinhoff add to the Steinhoff, I mean, the Stellenbosch Mafia narrative? Well, it damaged the narrative, didn't it? You know, because the Stellenbosch Mafia, the so-called Mafia, the members of the Mafia, um, are considered very successful. You know, they are considered successful businessmen who um, who, who run ethical businesses. You know, that's that's a, that's that's what they that's the image that they portray, and that's what people see. Um, and what what Marcus Joost and Steinhoff did was damage and dent that brand of Stellenbosch. A lot of people lost a lot of money in the in the Steinhoff crash, and it did damage the the the, the town the door um, people were very disappointed because you know they were starting to take pride in Steinhoff because it was this company that was that was exploding the share price was rocketing it was creating a lot of wealth for a lot of people um, and then because of dishonesty and because of bad business practices this whole thing crashed so it did a lot of damage to the town and there's still a lot of bruised egos in town what do you hope the reader gets from this book at the end of the chapter? Well, I, well, I hope I hope it's a it's an entertaining read. I hope people enjoy the story. Uh, I try to write it in a very in, a, in an accessible way so that people can enjoy you know the ride. You know, reading a book is such a pleasure, and life is too short mm. to read something that you don't enjoy. But also, what I hope people get out of it is is to put the town in context of our history, uh, of our uh, the, you know our, the, the place where the country currently finds itself in, um, and to get a, get some insight into these people's lives. You know, I don't want to make a value judgment or a, a judgment call on these individuals. Read it, enjoy it, um, and next time you drive through Stellenbosch, see if you can spot them.